Guten Abend, ich würde gern anfangen. I have a naughty, a naughty swear. <laughs> Let's see. So, wenn sich alle hingesetzt haben, dann können wir anfangen. Bevor wir mit der inhaltlichen Diskussion anfangen. Noch zwei Ankündigungen. Ähm, wie immer haben wir die Teilnehmerlisten von der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung. Anni verteilt sie. Ähm, ich würde Sie und Euch bitten, ähm, die Listen zu unterschreiben. Das ist wichtig für uns, Sie gehen rum. Und die zweite Sache, auch sehr wichtig, Thomas Soblowski war ja leider im Zug stecken geblieben und konnte seinen Vortrag zum Thema Kapitalakkumulation und Krise nicht halten. Und netterweise hat Thomas also sich bereit erklärt, nochmal nach Kassel zu kommen. Und wir haben einen Ausweichtermin gefunden. Der Ausweichtermin ist morgen. Also das sehen Sie hier ähm, auf ähm, der Folie angeworfen. Morgen kommt Thomas Sablowski, ähm, macht seinen Vortrag über Kapitalakkumulation und Krise um 14 Uhr, und zwar ist das in der Georg-Forster-Straße 4, Raum 1004. Sie sind und ihr seid alle herzlich eingeladen, würden uns sehr freuen, wenn viele Leute kommen. Ähm, ja, und das sind alle organisatorischen Dinge, die ich sagen wollte. I'll switch to English now, um, because we have an English language um, presentation tonight, and I'm very very pleased that we're joined by Bushra Setka from Johannesburg, South Africa, who's come all the way to Kassel to tell us about Marx and Marxism from a perspective from South Africa. When we're, we were discussing um, what we wanted to do for this semester and what kind of topics we wanted to cover, we were saying that an important part of the debates on Marx and Marxism have taken place and are taking place in the global south and it's important to us to at least um, map some of these debates um, and discuss the question that Mar well what how, how we can look at Marx from such a perspective and maybe how how this is different but maybe also how this is not so different from the perspectives we've heard so far. So I'm very, very pleased uh, that Vish was able to make it. Um, I'm going to say a few words about him and then um, you can start and present um, on democratic Marxism and South Africa. So Vish Satka is an associate professor um, of international relations um, at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Um, he's the editor, and we will hear a lot more about this in his presentation, I presume, of a book series called Democratic Marxism. And this book series is particularly interesting because it tries to um, lay out and establish a type of Marxism from the South that is very different from what we often get presented as orthodox Marxism, especially in the sense that it is critical of the idea that there should be a vanguard, so it's an anti-vanguardist um, Marxism from below, and we will hear about this um, in a minute. 
What is also important and I would like to, to stress is that Vish is not just an academic, he's also an activist. Um, so he's um, part of the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center in Johannesburg, which is called COPAC. And um, this is a network that is supporting the solidarity economy, so economic alternatives to capitalism in poor communities. Um, so I guess it's a very interesting um, perspective to hear from someone who's actively involved in some of the social struggles in South Africa which are ongoing um, and someone who's trying to look at the Marxist tradition from a southern perspective. So thank you so much Vish for being here and I'm very curious um, what your talk is going to be about. Thank you. You have the floor. Alex, and, and thank you for situating this talk. Uh, now, what happened? Okay, uh, how do I? Yeah. Well, um, a very, very big thank you to all of you for coming. I know what the outcome was with the game. Um, but a good dose of rigorous Marxism will help, I think. Um, but also a big thank you to Alex and Anil Shah and others uh, that have organized this seminar series. Um, and a big thanks to Professor Christoph Scherer and ICDD for enabling me to be here. Thank you. Um, W.E. Du Bois, um, the first uh, African-American sociologist and Marxist at the beginning of the 20th century, basically observed that the color line would be defining of the 20th century. If we think with his prescience, that message reverberates into the 21st century. We have seen an inflation of racialized and racist thinking and practices all around us. In that context, I think we have to ask some very, very hard questions as Marxists. We have to ask, was Marx racist? Was Marx ethnocentric in how he looked at the world? Was Marx Eurocentric? If you pick up the Communist Manifesto, and if you read it, there's a model at work in the Communist Manifesto. Modernity, progress, social change radiates out of the centers, if you like. But is that the sum total of the story of Marx? Today there are border regimes that are being policed. These are racist border regimes, like in Europe, keeping out people uh, from the peripheries, from where I come from. There are border regimes in the US that are brutish regarding children today. There's a white nationalism sweeping through the heartlands of capitalism today. Can Marxism explain that? At the same time, we also have a nativism rising in my own country. Um, economic freedom fighters, a political party, has declared that the white skin has not felt the bullet. It has also declared, from the standpoint of a very crude perception, that everyone who looks like me, Indians, are, if you like, racist in South Africa today. How do we explain this nativism that's rising, that's rocking our social and political orders? Well, does Marxism have the resources for this? And I think this is where placing a perspective from the global south around this, these questions is very, very important. Now, Marxism in South Africa has a long history and a long tradition. It actually has over 100 years of a lineage, if you like. And Olive Schreiner, a feminist and, if you like, a Marxist at the late 19th century, began using Marxist categories to understand South African capitalism. And she was one of those who placed Cecil John Rhodes, I don't know if you heard of the infamous colonialist called Cecil John Rhodes, but she placed him within a framework of imperialism. 
We've had other traditions of Marxism that have struck root in South Africa in the course of the 20th century, a Bolshevized Marxism-Leninism, a Trotskyism, and these grappled with the nature of racism within the South African social formation. There was a national question debate uh, that formed the basis of a strategic politics. Uh, there was an independent Marxist left in South Africa, 60s, 70s, and 80s, receiving their Marxism. We had a neo-Polansian moment in South Africa. We had a neo-Althusserian moment. We had an E.P. Thompson moment in South Africa in our academy. We've also had an organic Marxism in South Africa, shaped by the working class, their traditions, their dispositions to socialism, and so on. But today in South Africa, we are encountering the death of Marxism thesis. It's rampant, it's pervasive. Uh, the postmodern turn and the embrace of um, uh, post-structural thinking has, if you like, dismissed Marxism. Uh, and Marxism is caricatured in various ways as part of that dismissal and critique. There's a retreat amongst the academic left, and I'm not sure if it's unique to South Africa. It might be here in Germany, too. <laughs> Um, we also have a crisis of national liberation Marxism, the Marxism of the African National Congress, the ruling party in South Africa, which was very Marxist-Leninist in its imagination. The collapse of the Soviet Union really impacted um, on the ANC-led alliance as well. And you also have a lack of a working class project in South Africa. So Marxism is getting a bad rap in South Africa. But at the same time, in the midst of all of that, uh, there's an attempt to refine the critical impulse of a critical Marxist perspective. And this is the Democratic Marxism project in South Africa. It's an em attempt to embrace the independent Marxist left, the organic Marxism of South Africa's working class, uh, mass movements, and activist scholars. And we are answering certain questions in the affirmative. We are saying, yes, the tree of Marxism has been very important in the 20th century. And if you map it, uh, it strikes roots, uh, particularly in Africa, in very diverse and variegated ways. And we are saying that that is not the result of, if you like, um, a diffusion just from the north. Uh, there was an encounter with colonialism. There was an encounter with apartheid. And there was an attempt to really indigenize Marxism as a resource for struggles. We're also saying that Marxism also has, if you like, a set of resources to help us understand how global capitalism is organized today. And we are saying that this mode of analysis is not the monopoly or the preserve of Marxist ideologues or vanguard parties but it is an, a capacity that exists even amongst movements that are rising, that are trying to connect up the dots, whether it's climate justice movements, food movements, etc. And in South Africa, we've had two cycles of resistance, and we've thrown up some interesting movements that are trying to find a way for themselves from below. So we're also saying in some senses that vanguardism is anachronistic in the South African context. We've had a long history of vanguardism. The ANC declares it's a vanguard. The Communist Party in South Africa declares it's a vanguard. And these are vanguards that have truly lost their way. What we're also trying to do is have a dialogue between the global south and north. So Samir Amin, one of the leading neo-Marxist thinkers in our continent, gave us an endorsement for our project. And he still argues, in an in a, in a echo of Lenin, that the global south is the weakest link. And that's where change will come from. However, today we are living through a systemic crisis that's unhinging everything for all of us. So if you take the climate problem, the contradiction, it's a dangerous contradiction, according to Harvey, and it is affecting all of us. Inequalities are affecting all of us. The old 20th century cycle of resistance that threw up a Marxist-inspired Soviet socialism, social democracy, revolutionary nationalism, these have all started giving way to new cycles of resistance. And we need to learn from these cycles of resistance, and we need to understand the discourses, the forms of agency, the strategy and tactics, 
the propositions that are coming to the fore from these movements. Now the Democratic Marxism series is positioned in dialogue with these forces. Another very important premise for what we are trying to do is recognizing that Marxism as a body of thought is unfinished. Dogmatic Marxisms, freeze Marxism, uh, they're not able to appreciate the current dynamics that are shaping global capitalism and domestic capitalisms. You know, so for some people it all begins and ends with Lenin and his pamphlet on imperialism. We are not seeking a line from South Africa. So I haven't come here from Joburg armed with the line of march for you in this hall. Okay? We're also not seeking a school of Marxism, but rather diverse perspectives that can contend and contest and bring attention to the fore. It's also about a Marxism that takes democracy seriously. And here I'm talking about democracy that gives people control over their life condition. It's also about a Marxism that affirms universals, but in relation to particular oppressions. And Marx's theory is built on these universals, which I'll come back to. It is also against an authoritarian Marxism, particularly vanguardist forms. And these are vanguardist forms that have a history of horrors and calamities and disasters in the name of Marxism. And we need to really be self-reflexive and aware of all of these mistakes and problems. So the first volume in the Democratic Marxism series that tries to grapple with the questions I posed at the beginning is called Marxisms in the 21st Century. And essentially this is a volume that pluralizes Marxism and it recognizes that there isn't one Marxism. So this rich tree of Marxism is something we need to think with and embrace. We also need to recognize that as Marxism has traveled, it has, if you like, spatially in its national departures also found um, its own language, its own analytical capacities. In temporal senses, um, it is also about multiple historical trajectories and to think about historical change not just as a mirror of the West. So if you read Franz Fanon, for example, he is cautioning us about that in the wretched of the earth. Okay. There are different sources of critique of capitalism as a theme in this volume and imperialism. So, you know, if we look at Karl Polanyi, he does have something to say to us about the contemporary marketization of society. If you look at feminism, particularly socialist feminism, it has resources of critique that we can also learn from. If we look at radical ecology, it is also speaking to an anti-capitalist politics. If we look at uh, ideological frames that understand the simultaneity of oppressions, race and class, like in South Africa, they have something to teach us. So the first volume kind of breaks this ground. And it also recognizes that we have to advance Marxism in the 21st century in dialogue. It's got to be able to take on board the concerns of other anti-capitalisms on the horizons of change. Volume 2 in the series, Capitalism's Crises, Class Struggles in South Africa and the World, brings to the four various themes. It grapples with the nature of crisis today. And it actually unhinges narrow monocausal explanations of crisis. There's a just financial over-accumulation that explains this crisis. But there is something historically unprecedented about the convergence of systemic dynamics and tendencies of crisis today. So we never had the peril of climate change at the beginning of the 20th century. We have that peril today, alongside financialized over-accumulation, alongside a food crisis that is not feeding a billion people on this planet, that is making two billion people food insecure, and so on. But we're also living through a conjunctural crisis of neoliberalism, but yet at the same time it's not being abandoned. And it has failed. So you wheel out all the economic indicators, if you look at it in the South African context, high structural unemployment, one of the most unequal societies in the world, but we've had over two decades of neoliberalization but nobody is changing that trajectory. 
And again, we've seen a global cycle of resistance uh, that has come to the fore to push back. And there are key markers, there are key moments uh, that punctuate the cycle of resistance. But we are also seeing diverse political forms, left policy groups, movements, trade unions, networks, assemblies, all of these political forms coming to the fore in the context of resistance. And this particular volume kind of maps this. Uh, we have a great chapter on global transnational policy think tanks from the RLF <laughs> um, to the TNI to uh, focus on the global south, etc., etc. So it poses the question, about the political instrument and what kind of form is the political instrument taking today in the 21st century and in our observation we are seeing a very new expression of the political instrument there's a new generation of left parties in Europe for example so what has happened with Podemos and what has happened to Syriza with all its problems and challenges there's a particular articulation with mass movements that was not there with social democracy for example what we saw with party movements emerging in Latin America, the PT in Brazil, uh, is a new political form. And of course, it's run to its own uh, limits and problems. Uh, the rise of the movement for socialism in Bolivia is driven by a particular kind of mass base of the indigenous, organized in campesino movements, um, movements to defend life through water, etc., powerful movements that have a democratizing practice that are shaping political forms. So in this context, we, we, we have a conjuncture of deep systemic crises, but we're also seeing transformative resistance. And the big question that, that this volume grapples with is, can we find exit points from these deep systemic contradictions? Can we find ways forward? Can we find pathways vis-a-vis -vis the climate crisis? vis-a-vis -vis inequality, vis-a-vis -vis the crisis of democracy, and so on. The third volume in the series is called The Climate Crisis, South African and Global Democratic Eco-Socialist Alternatives. And basically, our starting point here is that the multilateral process has failed us, and essentially it has affirmed a geopolitics premised on eco-racism. So the historical climate debt of the global north is not acknowledged, it's not taken responsibility for, and we are left to solve this problem that most of us haven't caused in the global south. At the same time, the official thinking that's increasingly defining the discourse, particularly in the multilateral process, is Anthropocene theory. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of this for time, but just to say that in interrogating this theoretical framework in this volume, we are saying that when natural science and scientists who've developed this discourse, when they meet social scientists, and particularly Marxists, then something interesting happens. And that is that we, we look at the agency, uh, the forces shaping the climate crisis very differently, okay? And basically, what the volume argues is that capital is the geological force shaping the planetary conditions of life today. And that there's actually an eco-racism inherent to this global ecocidal logic. So when Trump says more fossil fuel extraction, well, South Africa is going through the worst drought in its history right now. That has a direct bearing on us, okay, in the global south. When parts of the African continent like Lake Chad is disappearing, and when Trump says more extraction, not less, it's impacting on us in the global south. This is an eco-racism. It is an imperial eco-racism that we need to be talking about. Because these are disproportionate impacts on us in the global south. And then, of course, there's a climate justice movement that now has to confront this continuity of fossil fuel extraction and so on. And increasingly, a eco-fascism dressing itself up around population growth is the problem. Then again, it's the darker nations that are the problem. Uh, democracy is the problem. Increasingly, eco-fascists are saying democracy is, if you like, the obstacle. Uh, military response to zones of chaos. The most advanced thinking on the climate problem is in the Pentagon. 
And the Pentagon wants to protect lifeboat America at all costs. Okay? So the rest of us are disposable. Uh, the rest of us are actually, if you like, expendable. And we are seeing a xenophobic response to climate refugees. So many people have observed the Syrian conflict and have suggested that it is actually a climate war. It is a very complex conflict. But from 2006 to 2011, a massive drought, a climate shock hit Syria. A million people moved from rural areas to the urban peripheries of Damascus. And a lot of that fed into the conflict. Okay? And a lot of those people moving out of the zones of conflict and trying to find pathways to the global north are in some senses climate refugees. But they are facing border regimes. So there's also systemic alternatives and so on coming to the fore, which we need to be grappling with. These are systemic alternatives that are shaping a renewal of socialism today, democratic eco-socialism. And the impulses for this are coming from different places. It's coming from those who have a critique of historical socialisms and its productivism and its emphasis on catch-up modernization and so on. Uh, it's coming from those within ecology that are saying that Marxism has to take on board the greening in imperative as well. It's coming from Marxists that are rereading Marx and are recentering nature, the center of uh, a Marxist historical materialism, uh, Marxist theory of capitalism, and so on. It's coming from those who are using the tools of historical materialism to understand particular ecological problems. So Nemo Basi, one of the leading climate justice activists in Africa, based in the Niger Delta, he is a protege of Ken Sarawiwa, who was hanged by the military dictatorship. Nemo is fighting Shell in the Niger Delta. He's been fighting Shell the greater part of his life. And Nemo, to explain Shell, and to explain the kind of ecocidal violence of Shell's extractivism, draws on historical materialism. And then, of course, there's a whole set of systemic or anti-systemic movements that are rising, that are articulating systemic alternatives. So the indigenous people's movements in the Andes are talking about the crisis of civilization, but they are also talking about systemic alternatives like the rights of nature or Mother Earth. They are talking about discourses like Summa uh, living well. Okay? It is evoking a different kind of ecological ethic and relationship with nature, drawing on indigenous cosmologies. If you look at um, some of the perspectives emerging from food sovereignty movements, food sovereignty movements today, again, are drawing on, if you like, peasant-based agency. It is drawing on a peasant-based science, agroecology, to put forward an alternative. And I think it's very, very important for us to recognize that this is part of the decolonizing of our consciousness and part of rethinking socialism in the 21st century. So that's an offering, if you like, from this third volume in the series. So this is the fourth volume in the series, Racisms After Apartheid, Challenges for Marxism and Anti-Racism. Um, and it's going to be out in the new year in February or March. And this brings us back to the questions I began with. And it basically attempts to grapple with this question about whether Marx was a racist and deal with this question squarely. So Edward Said, for example, uh, one of the founding thinkers that spawned post-colonial theory in his classic Orientalism, basically suggests that Marx was a Eurocentric thinker. He was a racist uh, epistemologically, ontologically in how he understood, if you like, the Oriental. But what Edward Said failed to recognize is that there is a lot of discontinuity, a lot of shifts, and a lot of complexity in the total corpus of Marx's thinking. And there's a, there's a lapse, if you like, a failure to read Marx in that totality. And so, if you really look closely at Marx, we've got to make a distinction 
Marx basically was formed in a Eurocentric milieu, a pseudo-scientific milieu. The Enlightenment was very powerful, and the philosophers of the Enlightenment, some of them were very, very racist in how they looked at and understood, if you like, the other. Marx was shaped and formed in that milieu, and anybody writing biographies and autobiographies, whatever, of Marx needs to locate Marx in that context. Marx, on one hand, was also shaped by intellectual resources, ethnographies and so on, of other lands, other worlds, uh, that was also tainted, if you like, with a particular Eurocentricism. But Marx was not, if you like, a supremacist, Eurocentric thinker. He did not believe that the West was, if you like, the culminating point for all of us. And this is something we, we have to grapple with and disrupt. Uh, and I'll get there. The second thing is that Marx was, for a moment, if you like, immersed in an epistemological Eurocentricism. And, and Marx displays this in his work up until the early 1850s, including when he's thinking about the Asiatic mode of production. But that changes, okay, because Marx evolves beyond that. Marx recognizes the deleterious effects of colonialism. He doesn't see it as a progressive force, okay, and that comes through in his writings increasingly. Marx recognizes the historical specificities of societies outside of the West, and he begins to recognize a multilinear set of possibilities. So the work of Kevin Anderson, uh, the work of Shanin, and a whole lot of other people helps us understand this nuance in Marx. So Marx wasn't prescribing that we all take on board the rationality of modernity, and so on. Okay. So Marx even leaves behind an epistemological Eurocentricism, if you like. But beyond that, in Marx's political writings, and I think this is where Kevin Anderson is very, very important for us, he helps us understand that Marx, in his position vis-a-vis -vis slavery in the United States, was actually very, very radical. Uh, Marx was consistently anti-racist vis-a-vis slavery in the United States. He was actually an abolitionist, and he was consistently so. He was consistently, if you like, critiquing uh, Lincoln and so on around this challenge. Marx also understood the importance of the unity in struggle to abolish save slavery of blacks and whites. Similarly, when looking at the question of nation and ethnicity vis-a-vis -vis island, Marx again recognizes how national divisions are forged, etc. The role of the clerics, the role of media, intelligentsia, imperial power, etc. And he makes a call for a politics that builds unity between the Irish and the British working class. So Marx is actually, in the end, a thinker that goes beyond his own Eurocentric limitations. Marx offers us, if you like, an anti-racism for the 21st century. And we need to look to that and we need to grapple with that. At the same time, Marxism has positioned itself in the 20th century against racism. But at the same time, it, can, it has come up against various limits. So if you look at social democracy, you look at uh, revolutionary nationalism, and you look at Soviet socialism, these were all informed by particular variants and versions of Marxism, in particular temporal spatial context. Some of these Marxism imbibed an epistemological Eurocentrism, a linear development. That's where we all must go, there's one standard, and that's where we must all march to. Some adopted Lenin's formulas on the national question and the right to self-determination. And in the translation of that in particular context, so in South Africa, for example, in the 20s and 30s, there was a very formulaic embrace of Lenin in South Africa leading to some absolutely mad positions on balkanizing South Africa and so on and so on. Uh, in places like Bolivia, the reception of Lenin's thesis was also very, very divisive. It led to a point where the Communist Party in Bolivia dismissed indigenous people's movements and agency and so on and so on. But we also had a dogmatic class reductionism 
which has also impacted on the capacities of Marxism to confront racism. And in that context, there's been an occlusion, a failure to appreciate, if you like, racism in its own terms. And I'll, and I'll come back to that. The other important theme that we grapple with is beyond this binary of black Marxism and white Marxism. Now, increasingly thinkers like Cedric Robinson, the late Cedric Robinson, felt that it was important to recognize and identify black emancipatory agency. And in that context, he inadvertently ended up inventing this binary of white Marxism and black Marxism. And there's a, there are serious problems with this uh, approach. Um, the one problem with it is that it fails to recognize the universals of Marxism. That capitalism is global, it exploits people across the planet. At the same time, there's a counter movement to meet human need against capitalism. These are some of the universals of Marxism. And these are universals that can articulate with particular struggles. And it can build unity. And it can take us beyond, if you like, dead ends that valorize particularisms and essentialisms and so on. So there's that lapse, but also at the same time, it doesn't make sense to have a Marxism for white people and a Marxism for black people. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. So, at the same time, I think what's happening in this engagement is an attempt to retrieve Marxism as a resource in the struggle against racism in its generality. At the same time, Marxism and anti-racism today is a very powerful theme in this volume. And we're trying to work out, well, what can Marxism offer us to understand racism? Okay, because this ground is largely occupied by post-colonial thinking. It's ground that's largely occupied by identitarian politics, by performative politics, and so on. Um, my biography and my life is politics, etc., etc. Well, Marxism does have a whole set of resources that we can draw on. It is analyzing race and racism and it is still doing this, and it is doing it in a way that situates racism, if you like, on its own terms. So there's a body of work around racism as a form of signification. Now this goes back to Hall, and it goes back to, 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 to a host, host of other thinkers. There's also attempts to think about racism as a relation of oppression in its own right. A relation of oppression alongside exploitation, in articulation with gender oppression, and so on. And so there's, there, there's some interesting work being done on this. This overlaps with the whole debate around intersectionality. Now, intersectionality can also be very, very shallow. It's about aggregation. It's about bringing together divergent groups, etc. It's an analytical tool in some senses, promising a lot, and Marxist feminists saying, well, it's not able to deliver because it's dealing with very complex phenomenon. At the same time, intersectionality is also not very, very original as it travels from the West. In South Africa, for example, we've appreciated the simultaneity of oppression. So particularly for women, um, race, class, gender, triple oppression, was always a central discourse in our Marxism. Okay? So interse intersectionality really doesn't offer us anything new because we, we've had this appreciation of these oppressions and so on. And of course, Marxists are also grappling with how class is gendered, how class is racialized, and so on. But what's also important is a post-Eurocentric Marxism that's in the making. So if you look at the work of Samir Amin, one of the leading neo-Marxist thinkers in Africa, Samir Amin has been consistent in his engagement and disengagement from a Eurocentric Marxist discourse. Um, if you look at the Marxists that are insurgent voices within post-colonial thinking, a lot of them have also, if you like, grappled with a whole host of challenges around modernity, grappled with a whole host of challenges around history and racism and capitalism and so on.
The volume also looks at new conjunctural racisms. And where is Marxism situated in the context of resistance to these conjunctural racisms, the new racisms that are emerging, the historically specific racisms that are emerging? Well, what is very striking is that Marxism is finding its voice in a lot of these struggles. So analyzing border regimes and understanding the class and social power that stands behind these border regimes is an offering that Marxism also gives us. If you look at the whole question of Palestine and Israel and the whole notion of whether this is apartheid, is this a form of colonialism, Marxists are grappling with this problematic. And uh, there's a very interesting chapter in this book as well. Marxists are also grappling with the mutations in Zionism to the point where it becomes a religious Zionism and increasingly uh, demonstrating morbid authoritarianism and so on. Marxists are grappling with the violence against black lives in the heartland of the United States. Uh, Marxists are grappling with the incarceration of black people in the United States and calling for the abolition of prisons like Angela Davis and other people. Marxists are arguing for an attempt to recognize white supremacy as a major challenge to unifying the black and white working class in the context of the United States today. So Marxism, I mean in South Africa today, um, the nativisms that are rising, um, the arguments being made that Marxism has always been white thought, has a genealogy that goes back to the West, and it's a white bearded man, and therefore cannot be taken seriously, well, it's being rebutted. And this series and this intervention is an argument against those kind of racializing perspectives against Marxism. So, in conclusion, I don't know what my time is, but I've just been... Okay, in conclusion, these are my bullet points. Uh, celebrating Marx. So we're meant to be in a jovial, happy mood. This is meant to be a party, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So, we can learn from Marx's own anti-racism for the 21st century. That's the message I want to give you here today. So if we really look at Marx and Marx's development, uh, and I mentioned his epistemological approach uh, to Eurocentrism, how he goes beyond that, uh, his political writings, he breaks with colonialism. He recognizes increasingly the connection between race, ethnicity, class, nation, and so on. And so there's a whole set of resources in Marx's anti-racism for us in the 21st century. There is a post-Eurocentric Marxism in the making that is deeply anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. What I'm contending here today is that you cannot be a post-Eurocentric Marxist um, if you are not deeply anti-capitalist and if you don't recognize uh, the deleterious impacts of imperialism on the world. Um, we've got to think beyond the rationalities and the logics of capitalism because it is imbued in the Euro-American center with the Eurocentricism. So if you are a profoundly anti-racist person, this is something that you really have to grapple with and think about. Marxist politics today is also about various agential forms. It is not the preserve, it is the, not the monopoly of professional revolutionaries plotting the pathways and charting the ways forward in history and so on. It is finding its place amongst a whole set of social forces and different political forms that are rising today uh, as part of counter-resistance, counter-movements, and so on. And it is doing this in dialogue with other anti-capitalisms. It is doing it in a way to take on board the concerns and the issues of these other anti-capitalism. And that is at the center of the praxis of the Democratic Marxism project that we're offering from South Africa, which is a collective project. Thank you. I don't know what happens now. <laughs> what happens now? Um, now it's time for some questions and comments. Mm -hmm.
Um, it's fine if you, es ist kein Problem, wenn Sie Fragen auf Deutsch stellen wollen, werde ich Sie einfach versuchen, schnell zu übersetzen. Um, so I will try, try to translate if there, there are questions in German. Um, so, any comments or questions? Hi, um, my name is Aram. I'm, I'm very interested in these post-Eurocentric Marxist perspectives, and um, I was I was wondering whether you could maybe give some more some more details how, what what it entails and how it, for example, maybe also differs from the anti-racist perspective of, if I'm not wrong, a colleague of yours at Bitwartes Rand, Akhil Mbembe. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. I assume there are some uh, some there's some dissensus and some um, points where you differ. Yeah. But um, but if I got his last book right, he's basically also pursuing this this line of thinking that he is saying, okay, this um, it is important to understand racism as a relation of oppression. But if we look at it nowadays we see that the position occupied formerly by the black subject is being universalized through neoliberal globalization to workers in, um, in other places, uh, workers not necessarily black workers. So what would your um, take on that be? Great. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, this very interesting presentation. I'm Tolga, Tolga Tören. Uh, I wonder uh, how or where do you place the, uh, the economic freedom fighters in South Africa in such a uh, framework? Thank you. Okay. Christoph. I'm uh, very uh, pleased with your talk and I can follow you that a lot of Marxists are doing interesting stuff. But I wonder what actually out of the theoretical framework of Marx can explain racism? What kind of elements do explain racism? Okay. okay maybe we stop here um, and then have a second round. Okay, well, if I start with the last question. Um, so if you look at the chapter in Capital where Marx deals with primitive accumulation, Marx begins to understand that in the originary moment of capitalism, racism was present. So when he talks about Africa as a warren of black skins, and he talks about slavery and so on, Marx is actually beginning to locate racism in how he understands the making of capitalism. Now, I think that's a very, you know, it's, it's a tight formulation, it's a powerful insight, but I think it takes neo-Marxists to build on that, if you like. And I think they, they are very, very interesting Marxists that have grappled with the question of slavery. Um, there's a lot of work on this. Um, Robin Blackburn, for example, has done amazing work trying to understand how slavery, racism, and capitalism come together. Um, this, is, this is also impacted on how people have thought about origins of capitalism outside of the centers of capitalism. So how has American capitalism developed and so on? Uh, there's amazing work again here on um, racial capitalism in South Africa. There's been an interesting current of racial capitalism as well that goes beyond industrial capitalism, but really tries to understand the deeper roots of racism in the making of, of modern South Africa, for example. This relates, of course, to, to what you are asking as well about the post-colonial voices uh, that are Marxist and inflected in this way. Uh, this is one set of contributions. 
Um, the, other, the other contribution, um, I mean, maybe I should just finish a little bit more with, um, with Christoph. So again, I mean, if, if we look at another side to, you know, so, so Marx is not just about uh, what's written in a text. And if we use the dialectical method to even understand Marx, then I do think we also have to look at Marx's political practice. And I think this is where the work of Kevin Anderson is very, very important for the conversation we are having, um, where he does this close reading of Marx's writings in um, the New York Tribune, his journalistic work, etc., where he's commenting on contemporary developments in his world. And what he extracts from that, I think, for us is very, very important around uh, the position on slavery, for example, how he understands the connection between racism, uh, nation, and class. And so, you know, many reductive Marxists don't take nation, they don't take racism seriously. But here you're seeing Marx in his own practice grappling with these issues in a serious way. Uh, he takes these conversations even into the International Working Men's Association. And he opens up these debates in some of the reports that are developed, etc., in the International Working Men's Association and so on. So it is a rich vein that we can explore. And I think I've tried to give some exposure to this. Because we've never read and understood Marx as an anti-racist. Okay. Uh, most people just see Marx as the founder of class analysis. And that's where it begins and ends. And it's not true. Uh, there's something deeper here. There's something richer here. So I think that can also be drawn on, and that's what I was trying to do, and it's drawing on work that's being done by, by other Marxists around this issue. And we can bring that into the contemporary, and we can bring that into our, into our struggles against racism uh, as part of resources for resistance. Now, this relates, of course, to, to um, the point that Aaron raised. So there's works around the history of capitalism and how racism articulates with that history, which I've mentioned. But th th there's also, if you like, uh, a whole lot of other work that has openly critiqued modernity and its temporalities. Again, drawing on, on this earlier Marx and recognizing that we all don't have to be mimetic. We don't just have to be copies of the center. Okay? And I think that is fascinating. And um, I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of work on this in, this, in this track, if you like, of thinking. So Samir Amin, whom I, whom I mentioned, um, I mean, Samir Amin recognizes in his work on world systems and so on, that um, we have to find our own pathways. Okay? If you read Fanon, Fanon is also, Fanon's, well, this is a difference with Achille, right? So when Achille reads Fanon, he doesn't read the Marxist Fanon. Okay? He reads a postmodern Fanon, he reads a Fanon that's quite anodyne in various ways. But Fanon has a model of class uh, working in his perspective. And Fanon, in cautioning about the pitfalls of national consciousness and so on, are also saying we cannot just valorize and romanticize tradition, culture, etc. But at the same time, he's making a plea for us to break with linearity, with the lineal. Okay? And I think that that's important, but in the context of radical agency. Okay? Uh, Ashil wouldn't go there, right? Uh, so, so I think this is very, very important. Um, so if you look at people like C.L.R. James, right, and the black Jacobins. So when Cedric Robinson writes about the black radical tradition and in delineating this tradition, right, so he locates C.L.R. James as a narrow black thinker. But C.L.R. James is a Marxist, okay. And so he gets sanitized. And C.L.R. James is suddenly, if you like, um, completely uncoupled from, from his perspective on resistance, on class, etc., etc. And I think these are some of the battles, uh, the battlegrounds within post-colonial thinking uh, that, that we need to be grappling with. So in the South African context, to give you an example, so novelists like Wally Sayanka and so on, um, who really have a, a very uh, Marxist-inspired perspective of the post-colonial, 
they are being read today in South Africa completely divorced of all of that. Okay? They are being read as just African thinkers. Okay? So I think th th those, those battles are there. And I think um, we need to be alive to them, and they don't have to become antagonistic. But what upsets me is the way Marxism gets caricatured in how those narratives are constructed, how they're placed into discourse, etc. Now, I think Ashil is a much more sophisticated thinker. I think um, there's a lot to learn from him. Um, and I think in his most recent book, uh, he does mention capitalism, and I think that's important. <laughs> And, but at the same time, you know, he draws our attention to some of the, the kind of racialized bodies of thinking in the Enlightenment. Um, I haven't debated with him or engaged with him, but I do think that he would place Marx to some extent in that frame because of association. Marx's proximity to Hegel. Okay. And so Achille, as you know, is very critical of Hegel, justifiably so. Okay. Uh, and, but I would, in defense tonight, say, well, there is a distinction to be made uh, between Hegel and Marx. Um, so yeah, there's some things in the Enlightenment we should trash, and we should call it out as racist. But I think Marx is a bit more complex. He's an insurgent voice in the Enlightenment. He's anti-bourgeois thought. Uh, his praxis is anti-racist, and that's what I've tried to argue here tonight. And there's something we can learn from that. Um, on the EFF, well, <laughs> economic, I was in a discussion this morning and this question came up as well. Well, the economic freedom fighters, it's important to kind of historicize it a little bit. Um, they come out of the African National Congress. Uh, they come out of the youth wing of the African National Congress. Julius Malema, the, the, the populist leader, was a leader of the ANC Youth League. Now, Julius Malema really makes his mark in South African politics as part of what is called the Zuma bandwagon. So Jacob Zuma, who was our previous president, was a very compromised man. He was implicated in a rape, and um, actually people like Malema put the woman on trial in the streets, in the court of public opinion. Um, he railed against our courts, uh, called them counter-revolutionary, and so on and so on. So street politics was used as a platform of intimidation, and Malema was at the vanguard of that. So beating the drum for Zuma to rise, and Zuma rises. In 2009 at the ANC's Polokwane conference, he becomes the president of the ANC, and after that he becomes the president of our country. Zuma is also implicated in corruption, in an arms deal, etc. Um, and becoming president uh, ensured that for 10 years he could evade the charges that he needed to answer in our courts. Uh, Malema falls out with Zuma. I think there was expectation of his own ascendancy. With Zuma rising, he would rise as well. Uh, Malema is also very corrupt. So he comes out of a particular province. There's a whole tender network and so on and so on. And he's fingered in all of that as well. Uh, parasitic accumulation. Uh, he comes with his skeletons, if you like, into the national uh, arena. But he, he also claims the mantle of left-wing revolutionary nationalism, calling for nationalization and so on. Malema ends up breaking with the ANC and forming the economic freedom fighters. The economic freedom fighters, um, ideologically, is made up of very complex elements. On the one hand, it is a... Um, pro-capitalist party, okay? So it's a party that when talking to fractions of capital will talk about stakeholder capitalism. On the other hand, it will talk about nationalization. Okay, now nationalization in my view is not necessarily emancipatory. And I think we, we, we need to have that debate, we can have that debate. Um, it is also deeply nativist. So it increasingly is using the race card in South African politics. Um, so the land debate in South Africa, which I'll come back to just now, is being inflected in a particular way against white farm owners. Uh, currently, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, he's, in terms of perception, saying that all Indian South Africans, well, about 2-3% of the population, 
We are all racists in South Africa and so on and so on. Yet we have a long history and tradition of resistance to apartheid in our community, etc. Um, so the logic of that is South Africa for Africans. So there's a bit of an echo of the alternative for Germany, right? Germany for Germans. Uh, that's kind of where it's going in South Africa. The other thing about it is that it's a very, very uh, performative politics. Um, so you don't get a sense that the EFF has debates about strategy and tactics and so on. So they wear these red overalls and they wear these red hats and so on. And uh, they earn a million rands per MP, etc. But they play at being worker and so on. Uh, and so it's a, it's a lot about uh, projecting a particular image, etc. So they've been very disruptive in our parliament. And many people on the left and right have said this is a good thing. You know, you're destabilizing, etc., etc. But actually that has ended up giving license for a very intolerant politics in our society where difference is not respected. Um, so if you disagree with us, you're going to be violent. And you see the EFF throwing punches against anyone they disagree with on national TV. That becomes a practice at a whole host of other levels in our society. Now to come back to the land question, the land question in South Africa is a complex issue. And the ANC state has three pillars to this. Uh, land tenure for farm workers, restitution and redistribution. It has gone back till 1913, where there was a dispossession, 1913 Land Act, 1936 Land Act, and had two moments of restitution. There are about 60,000 claims right now in the second round of restitution. There's a whole host of institutional and policy failures um, that are, if you like, the result of the ANC. So the ANC is not able to process a lot of these claims uh, efficaciously. Uh, it has a policy of willing seller, willing buyer. So it's a World Bank model of land reform. It'll take us another 40 years to deal with the restitution claims we have. There isn't an appropriate agrarian strategy in South Africa. So a lot of black farmers have been set up for failure in South Africa and so on. So the failures of the ANC are also something that the EFF is capitalizing on. At the same time, uh, there are 33,000 white farmers. There's high levels of concentration within that. They own most uh, land in South Africa. The state also owns land in South Africa. Religious organizations also own land in South Africa. There's complex tenure systems. You have communal land in South Africa. And uh, right now in, commu in, in communal contexts, um, chiefs are getting a lot of power. Uh, they are transacting with corporations behind the backs of their communities. The Zulu king is the largest land owner in the province of KwaZulu-Natal. He wants to create a rentier regime. He wants to rent out land that belongs to the community and make money for himself. Uh, there's all these complexities. Uh, land is getting lost through uh, golf courses, through mining, through developers, etc., etc., so land is a massive flashpoint on a host of fronts. But just to argue that we must amend the constitution and have expropriation without compensation doesn't deal with this complexity around land. The biggest critique of the EFF uh, from where I'm sitting is it's not talking about how we address the needs that people have for land. So what am I getting at here? We need a new food system. Our livestock production collapsed. Our maize production collapsed in the climate shock that we are living through. There's going to be more droughts hitting us in South Africa. We need a whole new food system to survive climate change. We need to be talking about a new food system in relation to land reform. We can't just be talking about expropriation without compensation. We need to be talking about needs for housing for poor people in our country. Um, homelessness is a big challenge in South Africa. The state has not been able to keep up with demand for decent housing in our country. So that is a big issue. We've become an urban society in South Africa. So again, just to posit a very narrow perspective in a controversial way is problematic. But as I said this morning, the door has always been open to white farmers in South Africa to negotiate with the state, to find a reconciliatory solution uh, that door is still open, actually. So it doesn't have to, if you like, escalate and become a race war in South Africa. But the way the EFF does its politics, 
it, if you like, pushes us in that direction. It is very dangerous. I don't know if I answered it. Really. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? Yeah. Thank you, Wish, for your uh, presentation. Um, I was wondering, and regarding the race questions, what you're rising in the next uh, volume, how are there all the kind of debates of black consciousness are fitting in? Are you seeing any kind of connections to bring that together with Marxism? Yeah. And the second one would be more, um, you were talking about transformative resistance before, yeah. and I was just wondering how that actually can look like, how we can get be a critical mass when you're looking at specific kind of issues, like in South Africa when you're looking at climate, but also uh, working class issues, etc. Thank you. Uh, my name is Archana Prasad, and I come from the Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. And uh, I guess I'm also asking the question from a southern perspective, and as a practicing Marxist thinker and activist, uh, you see, if you see, Look at the trajectory of Marxism in India and the way it developed from 1925 onwards. Uh, uh, Indian Marxism has some of the oldest anti-caste and anti-discrimination uh, uh, organizations. And the, uh, and the question of class unity only came up after these organizations came up as a trained historian of the communist movement, I can uh, tell you that. And therefore, the whole question of development of Marxism was a little bit more complicated because with the Soviet Union on one side and China on the other side, yeah, yeah. the party in fact led the debates on the uh, character of Marxism itself and what kind of Marxism should be developed uh, within India and uh, I think the mainstream communist movement decided not to adopt any one of those uh, mm. uh, sort of prototypes. So uh, my first question is that how, what do you think uh, of uh, this trajectory because then if you look at it in that context Mm. then Marxism is much more than Marx in one sense. Mm. And, uh, uh, yeah. uh, and uh, m Marxism as a method has found its sources in different types of uh, post-independent uh, uh, Marxisms also yes. in, within the South. So, uh, so in that sense to posit sort of democratic Marxism against mm. a vanguardist Marxism may be a little bit simplistic according mm. to me. Okay. Secondly, uh, I would also like to ask, because this is a question we face ourselves in the current dilemmas, you find that the vanguardist party has developed its own problems mm. and as, uh, <laughs> as active members of the vanguardist party, we also fight against the vanguardist party to change sure. the vanguard, so to say. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, um, so is the concept of a party redundant within democratic Marxism or what kind of a party do we want? Right. That's, uh, uh, according to me, it's quite a difficult question. It's, yes. uh, it's not uh, a simple question because uh, Marxism itself develops on the basis of the development of consciousness also at one level. And the consciousness has to be transformative. It cannot be just nativist or as you yourself mm -hmm. said. So I, my question to you is what kind of a party do you visualize or you, mm. don't, or you think of a Marxism without parties? <laughs> 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 okay. okay, so I, don't know. I, have, I have one more question yeah. if there's yeah. no other question. Sure. Um, and it's, it's very straightforward. Um, yeah. What is the vision of democratic Marxism? I mean, is it really sufficient to just say, well, now socialism is feminist and it's anti-racist and now we talk about eco-socialism mm -hmm. or do we really know? Because you mentioned also other concepts of living and other struggles that are not necessarily rooted in Marxism but are also anti-capitalist. So I was wondering what is the 
outlook that democratic Marxism gives us? Okay, great question. Okay, uh, let, let, let me start with uh, the whole question of consciousness. So there's a great chapter in the book by somebody called Peter Hudson. Uh, Peter is a political theorist in South Africa, and he tries to engage with the unconscious of South African capitalism. And he uses that category to, to try and explore how, while South African white capital is not outwardly racist today, okay, but there is still this subliminal dynamic at work in its practice, in how it orders capital, how it organizes capital, and so on. So he draws a bit on Lacan to grapple with consciousness um, in the book. And he opens up, I think, a very interesting way to think about racism and capital's practice. Okay. Uh, there are other chapters as well um, that are grappling with this question of consciousness. Now, South Africa has been obsessed with what is called the national question debate within national liberation politics. Again, it's the inheritance from Leninism. And um, the national question debate has also been shaped by conjunctural analysis, right? So where are we in the struggle today and what is happening to race, class, gender, and so on and so on. Um, there, there, there are two perspectives um, that are critical of the national question debate as part of building popular consciousness in South Africa. The, the, the first perspective argues that um, there is an absence of class analysis in national liberation politics that understands the way race and class have been remade in South Africa today. So in a sense, if you read ANC documents, you read sociology. You do not, and I'm not anti-sociologist, um, but I mean, when you, when you read sociology, um, so if it talks about the middle class, it'll talk about income metrics to situate this middle class and so on and so on. It's shot through with that kind of positivism. It's not really trying to understand the social formation and class formation in post-apartheid South Africa that it has been responsible for. Okay. Uh, it wouldn't look at parasitic accumulation and how that has created, if you like, um, particular class forces in our society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so there's a challenge to national liberation Marxism to understand class formation and how it's implicated, also in patterning race, etc. The other critique uh, of the national question uh, framework is an open rejection of the national question framework, and basically arguing that we need to foreground the ecocide question rather than the national question. And the ecocide question has to do with the climate crisis. That South Africa, um, its people, its classes need to be grappling with this question of ecocide and the destruction of all of us in the context of climate crisis. It's arguing this is the central contradiction, this is the central question that we are facing. But it is not posed in a vanguardist way and it is posed as, as seven theses for us to grapple with uh, around the need for transition and so on. Which brings me to your second question. That um, what we've also been observing uh, in the kind of global cycle of resistance um, are new political practices that are deeply transformative. So if you look at what happens in Argentina, for example, in 2001 when the economy collapses, I mean, workers take over factories. Today, there's over 350 factories run by workers in Argentina. There are a whole host of challenges. You know, and I've, with Michelle and I, we've been there many, many times to study those worker-run enterprises. Uh, but they are fascinating as a transformative practice. Okay? Um, if you look at food sovereignty today, food sovereignty is really about building a new food system. Okay? It's about building seed banks. It's about proliferating agroecology as a scientific practice around agriculture, drawing on indigenous knowledge. Uh, it's about retrieving the food archive. Um, this is decolonial practice, the food archive, and food getting extinct by monoculture, and so on. These things are happening right now. 
And these are transformative pathways that are emerging. Solidarity economies amongst waste pickers um, in South Africa, in Brazil, etc. Uh, these people are aggregating their power and they're talking about zero waste societies. They are talking about dematerializing our societies, closing the loop. Uh, they don't just want to be recyclers. Okay? So they have a bigger vision. Uh, so I think transformative politics has arrived and transformative politics is about a different conception of power. So classical Marxism-Leninism is premised on the idea that the state has absolute power. But transformative politics, which Michelle and I are grappling with in a book we're finishing right now, is about different forms of power. So learning from, from, from the literature on trade unionism, um, structural power is part of transformative politics. So if you build cooperative banks, you are deglobalizing your society. You are challenging the financialization of capitalism, right? Uh, you're giving control to people, to communities, etc. Uh, there's a form of movement and associative power uh, that's also coming to the fore in transformative politics. Uh, when you bring together social forces, etc., um, into movements, you are building the capacities for change. Uh, farmer to farmer exchanges uh, within food sovereignty is a good example of that where farmers in parts of our continent can travel to other parts of our continent and learn about agroecology and seed saving and so on. When you look at uh, direct power, uh, that's also coming to the fore and these are, f these are forms of intervention in street politics, in mass resistance, etc. And then of course there's symbolic power where these examples are demonstrating another way forward. So transformative politics comes with a different conception of power and politics, different from Leninism, different from technocratic power that's very much part of social democracy, uh, and different from the machine politics of national liberation. Uh, it's about building agency from below. It's about a constitutive conception of power. Now, when you look at uh, the, the trajectory of Indian Marxism, so I'm very naughty, so I, I, I got two contributors to this volume who are critical of the CPI and CPIM and so on. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and their argument is contrary to your, your, your perspective. And they are basically saying that the CPIM and all the communist parties in India, while they have said something about caste and so on, but they haven't really built a serious anti-caste movement. And so the argument is that there is a Dalit resurgence and so on taking place in India, but that's not linked to the communist left and the Marxist left, etc. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So I was provoking them to say, well, what is caste? You know, is caste a form of racism? Okay, and... Um, because when activists came from the Dalit movements and so on to the World Conference Against Racism in South Africa, some of them were arguing that Indian society is deeply racist. Uh, phenotype uh, operates, okay, it's your character whether you're light-skinned or dark-skinned and so on. Um, India is a deeply racist society. Then these Dalit activists were arguing that. So I was saying, is caste racism? Let's, let's open up that debate. So this is a response also to that question where these contributors are not arguing that caste is racism. So it's, it's kind of interesting, but it is a form of oppression. It's a, it's, it's a relation of oppression and so on. So, so I, I mean, I think it's an interesting counterpoint to what you are saying about the trajectory, how Marxism has tried to grapple with caste and caste oppression. Um, and so I don't know how that sits with you. But I agree with you that this is about translating Marxism, making it work in the Indian context and so on. Uh, you know, when it comes to the question of the party, um, you know, I'm not sitting here as the, standing here as the ideologue having the answer to these questions. Uh, I mean, what, 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 what we were learning in this journey is that people are constituting their agency um, and sometimes they're taking it to the next level. So if you look at the movements that threw up the PT, you look at the movements um, that, that threw up the mass in Bolivia, etc. Uh, these are social forces that have reached their own political conclusions on what kind of institutional political projects they want to have. Um, all I'm saying is that we must learn from them. Um, 
my own, and then, you know, there's, there's an amazing piece by uh, Hilary Wainwright, who edits Red Pepper magazine in the UK. And Hilary is, has studied political forms in, in Europe. And she does a very interesting take on the new generation of left parties in Europe today. These are not vanguardist parties. These are parties trying to, so Podemos is trying to break the boundary between membership and citizens uh, in Spanish society. I'm not sure if they're successful. I'm not sure how far they're going, but I think it's, in, it's interesting and we need to study these developments to see where party practices are going. I mean, is the Delinka, for example, articulating with movements or is it a typical electoral force? I mean, I think these are interesting questions to grapple with. Um, but I think Franz Fanon had a very interesting conception of the party form. He called it the people-driven party. And that still has to be invented. And I would go further to say it should be the people's citizen-driven party, learning from Podemos and learning from the party movements that have emerged in Latin America and so on. So I think what, what's emerging on the left horizon is something very interesting and exciting where we can innovate and invent um, the political instrument in very creative ways. I mean, to develop a political program today in the era of social media, etc., you can engage the demos, you can engage the people in such creative ways using social media uh, around a party program. It just doesn't have to be the faithful sitting at a conference defining the line of march for society. There's something exciting that can happen, engaging everyone in society. Um, the vision of democratic Marxism, so this is not a... Um, um, this is not like worked out as a blueprint in terms of where we're going. Um, so it's based on certain critical questions, realizing the crisis of Marxism. And you know, Marxism, because it is the other of capitalism, it will always be here. It's the red mole. Um, it's it's, it's the, the, the dialectical challenge to capitalism. Uh, and it has many, it's had many, many crises in the 20th century. Uh, we've come out of a crisis of Marxism in South Africa, where ruling party Marxism, national liberation Marxism has failed us. Okay. So we, we are asking a whole set of questions about where do we go? Um, what can Marxism offer uh, the emancipation of our society, the emancipation of our continent and the world? Um, and we are asking those questions in a very, very critical way. Um, we are also asking them in a self-reflexive way, saying that, you know, we don't have the answers, so let's, uh, let's have the dialogues, let's talk to other anti-capitalist forces. So, you know, having Occupy activists in, in our second volume was very revealing about how they organized Occupy. Uh, how did they put an assembly together? Was this really democratic? How did they start imagining a different United States, okay? Um, and just having them in the volume and engaging with them was fascinating. Um, uh, similarly, um, having activists uh, from Bolivia and Ecuador in dialogue with us, talking about indigenous resistance today, um, how indigenous communities are drawing on their resources for struggles, was, it was a learning moment for us. So I think in terms of, um, you know, Talking about a definitive vision, I would say it's a work in progress. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's in a state of becoming, uh, these are intellectual resources for debate. And ideally, we'd like to see more conversation, more debate, more reimagining, um, uh, more cross-fertilization, if you like. If, if you're talking about a loose vision, maybe that's what it is. Um, but I don't think there's some kind of fixed terminus uh, for this project. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much um, for not just giving us a very, very um, detailed account of what the Democratic Marxism pro uh, Project is about, but also telling us in detail about South African politics and the situation in the country and your take on it, um, and also linking this with various other theoretical and political developments. So. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming here, um, for making this very long journey. Um, Thank you. And for engaging with us, with us, because obviously it is also our attempt to yes. engage in such a debate, so yeah. it was very fitting. Mm. Um,
the conversations, I guess, can be continued over dinner. Absolutely. Um, ich habe noch eine letzte Ansage. Wir haben nächste Woche wieder einen sehr interessanten Vortrag, der auch sehr politisch sein wird. Jan Hoff wird über Wege aus dem Kapitalismus sprechen, was dann sozusagen unseren letzten Block ähm, der Vorlesungsreihe einläutet, der die Frage stellt, wo man mit Marx heute politisch hingehen kann. Ähm, ich würde mich natürlich sehr freuen, wenn Sie und wenn Ihr ähm, wiederkommt und wir uns nächste Woche wiedersehen. Schönen Abend. Ein big thank you to all of you. Thank you.